Welcome to On the Brink, a fresh lens to take you and your business to new heights. Hi, I'm Andy Simon. I'm your host and your guide and your anthropologist who wants to help you see, feel, and think about things through a fresh lens. And this is really important because in fast changing times, what happens is that the old isn't working and the new isn't here yet. And it's for us to begin to prepare for the future, create the future. And it really is exciting. Don't be afraid. Manage that mind and don't let it hijack it. Here's what's happening for today's podcast. I have Kim Graham Lee here. She's a beautiful woman who's got an amazing research project going on that I'd like you to know more about and perhaps participate in. But let me tell you a little bit about, uh, about Kim and a little bit about her organization, Integrating Women Leaders. Kim has over 35 years of diverse business experience, including C-level leadership and startup and growth companies and account management for some of the largest corporations in the world. For the last five years, and this is where it really you know, resonates with me, she served as CEO of Integrating Women Leaders, IWL Foundation, which is an Indian, Indianapolis-based organization founded in 2010. And she's focused on accelerating the advancement of all women to drive individual and organizational growth and impact. I can read that, but let me tell you, this is a very exciting woman who wants to really move the needle on how women can thrive in fast changing times, of course, in their careers, absolutely. But how do we do this has become a real challenge. Can't do it alone. In my book, Rethink, there are 11 women and every one of them asked me to make sure I spoke about the male mentor who helped them. Because at the time they were rising, there were no female mentors to help them no allies. And that's something we want to talk about today. The research that Kim is working on for the IWL is in conjunction with the Women's Business Collaborative, which I'm a vice chair of one of the channels there. And I'm deeply committed to helping women change the myths that are holding them back so they can become the women they've always wanted to be. You know, it was a George Eliot's quote, it's never too late to be the woman you always thought you could be. And now we're going to hear more about it. Kim, thanks for joining me today. Oh, thank you so much, Andy. Fun to be here and inspired by you and another beautiful woman. Thank you. Well, tell the listeners, who is Kim? Tell us about your own journey. I can read that, but as always, it's sure. much more fun to listen to it. Who are you? Well, who am I? Well, I'm going to start professionally first, but I will wrap, up, wrap it up with a personal bow. Uh, I started my career, spent 20 years with a global marketing research firm called Walker, which is what brought me to Indianapolis. 41 years ago and uh, rose the ranks there and uh, worked with the largest companies around the globe measuring what drives business success. So I like to say I had the models of business in my head <laughs> from, again, working with the biggest brands around the globe and doing studies for them. In 2000, and timing was everything, four months before the, you know, the dot-com bust, I was recruited to the tech sector where I spent really the next 15 years and was a pioneer uh, leading different tech software SaaS companies here in Indianapolis. And it was just a really exhilarating experience and I learned a lot. And it was during that involvement actually that I got involved with IWL shortly after it started. But uh, another pivotal part of my career journey is that I transitioned somewhat to leadership development. I was hired through my involvement with IWL on the board to start a company called True You, which was a really innovative model of how to help people become the best versions of themselves. So it wasn't training for companies on how a person could do their job. It was really about helping them be leaders in their own lives. So this convergence of research, tech leadership, leadership development. And then I had the, the great fortune of accepting an interim CEO job with IWL. I had been on the board for seven years and was very engaged and learning a lot, which is part of my story. I didn't know a lot of what I'm focused on. It didn't hit me for 35 years what was really going on in the workplace. But I accepted the helm of IWL for just four months. And here I am five years later. <laughs> uh, but personally, and this is really important too, I am a mother of two adult children, a son and a daughter, who I'm incredibly proud of, who are in their careers. And I'm also a Grammy to uh, three amazing children, a three-year-old Griffin, 
to a soon to be two year old Adrian and Gabe who is three months and they're they're becoming an even bigger part of my why on why this this work really matters. I'm glad you mentioned that because I've learned over time that often I forget that I'm also a mother. And yeah. sometimes I introduce myself and then I hit myself and I said, but you're also a very successful mother. Your daughters are happily married. You've got beautiful grandkids. And yeah. uh, why do we diminish the mothering part of our yeah. careers and to emphasize the professional part of it? And I am right. not sure, but I work hard to remember I am a whole yeah. person with more than that. So this is a, a very exciting time for you because um, tell us about IWL. Where has it sure. evolved? Well, I'm fascinated. Well, as I mentioned, it started in 2010, and I had the pleasure of meeting the founder about two months after she started and got really involved from the beginning. And you know, you shared our mission statement, with is, which is to accelerate the advancement of all women to drive individual and organizational growth and impact. And I, I think another way to describe what we do is to say, we are really trying to change that picture where there are more women entering, well, I'm sorry, graduating with college degrees, entering the workforce, but at each level of that you know, talent pipeline up to the top levels, women are dropping off. And what that's the picture we're trying to change and, and who we work with, you know, more mid-market and, and larger enterprise organizations to change what the experience of women is in those organizations. So big part of our work, what I would add to that, and it is something that I'm incredibly personally proud of in terms of, I would say my thumbprint on IWL, especially being one of the only leading tech companies um, for a chapter of my career, I realized that we truly have to invite and engage and, and, and advocate for men to be a part of this work. Because as I said, as a board member for years, women talking to women was not gonna change the picture. So this male allyship is critical. We've developed a lot of programming around it. And then something I would add, Andy, is that this gender discussion is very, very important. We, we haven't made a lot of progress in the four plus decades that I've, I've been working in in my career, but we have to also recognize that it's the gateway to other equally important conversations and efforts where people don't feel like they can show up as who they really are. And those are conversations and people that also need to be brought into this work. And I'm really proud because we are beginning to do that as well. This is complex because you step back as an anthropologist and we'll get to allyship in a moment. The yes. society in which we're in changes slowly. You know, mm -hmm. humans have evolved through changing the story. And I often say to people, for us, the narrative has to change because right. in some ways we live what we believe to be our illusion of reality. And that becomes difficult to shed when you try and build something different, which we don't really know what that different is, right? Yeah. And, and we really don't have a good story about what we want to be or how to be it. We know what we've known. And, and the whole society, people say, how do we change male-female relations? I said, well, let's start down in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. You know, because Vivian Paley's work showed what boys do with blocks and girls do. Girls build kitchens and nurseries yeah. and have babies. And the boys build forts and become pirates and want to, you know, save the damsel in distress. And it goes right up through the time when they're in business. And my friend Andy Kramer remember, reminds us that mm -hmm. when she was on the compensation committee of her law firm, the guys wrote great, great reviews about how they had climbed the Empire State Building to save the damsel in distress. They hadn't changed when they were five. And the women were all working collaboratively together to save the client. So they never had a problem. And the guys got paid more and moved up and the women just kept their jobs if they were lucky. And, right. and so the, the culture and the stories and narrative we have are extremely important, which then leads us to the work you're trying to do now with allyship. Let's talk right. a little bit, what does this mean? Because I know the WBC has a whole group yeah. of people working on allyship. And, and as right. I mentioned, that, that the folks in my book all wanted me to talk about the men who mentored them and made sure that they succeeded. Marie Gallo talks about how many men pushed her in different directions because they see who she could be better than she could see who it is. 
Talk to us. What does the allyship mean? What are we looking for? Well, it's so interesting. I, I mentioned that I well brought this to IWL in particular. I would say even beginning in 16. And if you even type in allyship, it's spell check. <laughs> what's interesting, it was dictionary.com's word of the year. So if you'll allow me, I'd like to read what it says, and then I have my simple definition. But this is what, you know, it's no longer Webster, <laughs> it's dictionary.com, but allyship, the status or role of a person who advocates and actively works for the inclusion of a marginalized or a politicized group in all areas of society, not as a member of that group, but in solidarity with its struggle and point of view and under its leadership. So that's dictionary.com's <laughs> definition of allyship. But, but what I have come to define it as, and especially in this context of men advocating and being allies for women, is that a male ally is someone who will advocate for a woman even when she's not in the room. Yes. And I've had the pleasure of doing a lot of work since 18 with different organizations in person and virtual, needless to say. And that, that just seems to resonate when someone will stand up for someone who has less power, privilege, influence, even when they're not in the room. That's what an ally is. Well, and the urgency of it is not to be underestimated because, you know, one of the chapters in my book, Dolores Tyler, talks about leaving the Detroit News because whenever she spoke up at a meeting, nobody paid any attention to what yeah. she said. And she was their best yeah. salesperson. And I've been at meetings with 49 men, a nun and me, and I didn't say much either. Someone said, is that a joke? I said, no, that was really the board was all men and then the two of us. So yeah. it becomes important for men to see this through a fresh lens and feel strong, vibrant, masculine, and not, not catering to or diminished in some fashion, an ally for the business and a we mm -hmm. so that the women and the men can both you know thrive here so let's right. talk about the research that you're working on what are we trying to find and how are we doing it well would you mind if i comment quickly first on what you just said because i think this is really really important to understanding allyship and and you you hit on it handy when you were talking about you know not women not speaking up as much and not being maybe as mm -hmm. uh, able to verbalize or vocalize your opinions, share your ideas. There's a reason for that. And it's called unconscious bias. Yes. So you can't have a conversation about allyship without understanding at, a root, at the root of this. And you mentioned kindergarten before, is that all of us are products of the environment. Our brains are wired for shortcuts. There's been this conditioning. And what's interesting is, is we women hold some of the same biases that the men do yes towards women so there you know we could spend the next hour just talking about you know unconscious bias the five types of gender bias that are very common in the workplace you hit on one um, which is the attribution bias by the way yeah. so anyway this research is that we're entitling it it's the state of allyship in action I love benchmark it. study and very intentional about that inaction, because uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the Lean In and McKinsey Report, which is some phenomenal research that's done on women in the workplace every year. And there's been a little bit of allyship research done, especially as it relates to women of color, but there hasn't really been a study to look at all women and also to gain the perspective of men. Mm -hmm. I've been doing a lot of work for the last few years, in, in, including a major global brand uh, training and working with male allies across the globe in that globe in that organization. And so much of this is just not knowing. Yes. People not being aware of unconscious bias, of privilege that you have. So this research is designed to really provide a baseline, a benchmark of what does, what does it look like? What's happening in organizations from the perspective of the women and what are the men seeing? And, you know, as a, a researcher for the first 20 years of my career, I, I used to say, you can't manage what you don't measure. We need metrics around this so we can see if, in fact, we are moving the needle. 
And this is an important first step in terms of conducting this research at a national level. Uh, specifically, we're, we're looking at mid-market and larger enterprise organizations, again, that corporate talent pipeline picture. And we're incredibly excited about it and also partnering with the WBC to, to execute and communicate about it. Let's talk about what research can tell us and what can happen as a result of it. Because my hunch is that you don't, as much as you enjoy research, it's not an end. It's a means to go somewhere. I mean, I had an article that I was just looking at this morning about it's not that good in women-owned businesses for women either. Mm -hmm. And so part of this is transforming human relationships in a way that provides something better. And I was going to yes. fill in the blank, but I'm going to ask you to fill in the blank. Because what, yeah. because, you know, studying the men and how they think about their um, conversations with and attitudes towards and how they hear what women say is phenomenal. It's amazing. And how women, in fact, interpret what's done and how they mm -hmm. play the right role. Um, I'll tell you my theory in a moment, but, but, you know, talk about where are we going with this? Because the WBC is so excited about it. Because if we can begin to change the playing field for women and for men, because you can't do it alone, what, what can happen? Your thoughts. A couple of thoughts. Well, you know, the journey of well, allyship is a journey and this research effort is a journey. So we are, we are taking a snapshot in time today <laughs> of what that looks like. And an, an important point is to say, even the last two years have really impacted that picture in a negative way that corporate talent pipeline, many women, one out of three is thinking about stepping out or stepping down from her career. And we, and we can't let that happen. <laughs> so this research, I, I used to say this in my marketing research career and the same is true here. Even doing this research study, people that take the study or do the survey, they're gonna be educated along the way yeah. because this is a relatively new concept. Wasn't even a word <laughs> until recently. <laughs> And what we're trying to do initially, and we will be adding to this in subsequent years, we want to really look at that gap. What is that gap of what is the experience of women in the workplace and how men view that? Because so much of this is unintentional. So much of this is based on systems that have been developed over many, many, many decades even. And it's yeah. going to take time but we have to build awareness. We have to have training around this and we do have to work together. So that's why it was important yeah. to have the male voices as part of this research as well. Uh, it's not that anyone is intentionally trying to hold women back. It's what's happened. And so we have to work at this from a couple of different aspects. And I do, I am excited that having some data and metrics around this will be educational and we'll also be at a call to action for some organizations. I think as you're speaking about how many situations I've either been in or I've been with others who have spoken about the, uh, the men's club and the men going out to the bar at the end of the day, not inviting the woman. Um, yeah. And being, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I was a solo woman on a C-suite. Um, it's quite lonely. We like company, it is. we like to belong. Uh, I've had academic institutions where the students said, you know, you think you have a diverse student body, but we all stay on our own sides. You know, birds of a feather flock together. Humans are very right. comfortable with others who are like us, whether it's racial or sexual diversity or gender. And, and so part of this is changing the awareness. You said they're not intentional. <clears throat> mm -hmm. and so much of this is simply habit. Um, learned early and, and reinforced. It's the positive way in which we open the door for the woman. She doesn't open it for us. Um, it is, and I say for the guy, but it's an interesting opportunity to set the stage for what we're trying to change. And I often preach that life is theater mm -hmm. and the roles have been well honed early on and nobody has, to, and no one, has, no one knows how to play the different roles. But if Robert Redford can play different roles, then so <laughs> can we. Right, right, and and yet the media hasn't shown yet. I'll call it an allied kind of experience. Um, the conversations aren't there yet in our TV. 
Um, the guys are the firefighters and the gals are the odd ones trying to fire fight. Um, so we've got a lot of work. So your research could be a real multiplier if it can escalate into changing the conversations, changing the narrative, the media, the models that we see. Uh, I always go back to Marion Edelman who founded the Children's Defense Fund said, if you can't see it, you can't be it. And mm -hmm. for you, it's I, if I, they don't see it. So, right. yep. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I was going to just say a couple of things. Birds of a feather, that's the affinity bias at play. <laughs> By the way, that is the affinity bias, one of the five. You know, I, I said before that it's a journey. And the men that I have worked with uh, over the last several years, it really is an aha moment for them yes. when they when they they learn about this. And and you know. When, when you talk about even unconscious bias, we all have it. We all have it. You and I have it. We all have it. It doesn't make us bad. It makes us human. Again, there's a reason for it. So it is a journey. And one of the things that we're doing in our work with male allies is helping them see where they are on their journey. Are they just learning about it? Yes. I do think there is a segment and we, ha we have an assessment actually that we use. Um, when people enter into programs to see where they're at. And this is actually one of the questions in the survey. We ask people to assess where they think different levels of leadership are on this continuum of allyship. And there are some that are anti. I think it is a small segment, but we're gonna get some data around that. And then there's other levels leading up to advocacy, being that advocate that is really you know, um, supporting that woman even when she's not in the room. So it is a journey. You have to celebrate progress along the way. Recognize sometimes you're going to slip back. Uh, and, and I think this is a really an important point. And this was really an, a powerful aha moment for me even. It was at one of our conferences. We're most known for doing um, these annual women's leadership conferences that men also attend now. And we're building on programming, including an allyship summit later this year that, that we're great. incredibly excited about. But I had an aha moment listening to one of our own speakers. It was the head of DNI at Salesforce, gay partner, two-year-old daughter. And I remember walking out of that ballroom and thinking, I have so much more privilege as a white woman than a woman of color. And here I've been advocating for you know men to be a part of this work. <laughs> And I realized too that I haven't advocated for my brother who is gay, like I could not that I didn't support him, but when I heard comments, did I speak up? Did I call things out? So I realized even in this role, we all have an opportunity to be an ally yeah. and to leverage whatever privilege we have to help so lift someone else. So we hope people will be educated. We'll get a picture of what's happening in organizations and we can continue on this journey. Yeah. To get to a place where people can show up as who they are, be the best version of themselves, and organizations are leveraging that full talent bench. It's going to take time. <laughs> well, but you're also defining a new reality, which I think is so powerful, because belonging is what humans want. Yeah. And when you are different from others, you're an outsider, and that makes it lonely. Right. And that's not a healthy physically or emotionally for any human. And these are fast changing times. So if right. people want to participate in the research, and then we'll talk a little bit about your conference. Yes. Um, can they do that? Is there still time to jump in? <clears throat> Absolutely. Thank you. And thank you so much. Yes, please go to iwlfoundation.org. And there's information on our website. Again, that's iwlfoundation.org. And you can take the survey even from that. We are encouraging larger organizations, you know, I would say 250 employees plus, please reach out to me directly because there's a benefit if you have at least hundred employees, 50 men, 50 women, we're looking for quote, what we call a representative sample. And we will share your own company's results with you. Not, that will not be publicly shared, but you'll get some of your own data in addition to contributing to this larger, you know, aggregate view of what is happening across a number of organizations, a number of industries. So you can reach out to me directly. And my email is kgram, G-R-A-H-A-M Lee, L-E-E -E, at iwlfoundation.org. 
And, we'll and that's what the WLBC is helping us with as well, the outreach to its, its community of, of corporate partners. Super. And we're so grateful. <laughs> well, and we are as well because we can preach allyship but sometimes I'm not sure what we're preaching. Yeah. And, and sometimes I'm not sure what we're celebrating or criticizing. And so you're on the brink, my first book is called On the Brink, you're on the brink of transforming the way we see this from yes. a nice idea to something that's actionable because I think the actionable part is really important. It is about action. And you know what's so interesting, Andy? And it, the things that are happening every day in the workplace, even a lot of little things <laughs> add up to people feeling very much on the outside, feeling less than. You, you, you cited an example earlier about your own experience. And when you are the only and your voice isn't heard in a meeting or you're a woman and you're expected to do the note taking or you're interrupted three and a half times more than men are in a meeting. You know, it's those little things. And, and we say in our workshop, you know, it's death by a thousand paper cuts yes. and people can't show up as who they really are. And so um, it laughing. is exciting work. Yes. You're laughing. What yeah, were you laughing I'm thinking about? <laughs> one woman who's president of a large insurance company that I'd like to introduce you to. And she oh, tells awesome. a story because she's a president of a company, a corporation. But she tells the story about being the hat girl. It doesn't matter the coat girl. It doesn't matter where she walked into. The guys started giving her the coats to hang up. Yeah. So she's in Lloyd's yeah. and she's bringing them a large uh, client to discuss. She's president of a large insurance company and they're giving her the coats to hang up. And she said, I just, I just became the coat girl. Um, uh, sometimes yeah. I'm the coffee person. <laughs> Can you get right. a coffee? Uh, and, and, and she said, and sometimes it's a cleaner upper, assuming that I'll take care of what's left on the table. But those are um, unconscious biases. And they're also old habits. Um, they're microaggressions. They are. And, and micro they, inequities. Yep. Mm -hmm. But they are a statement yeah. about how, what has to change. And, right. and how do you, she, so her strategy for change isn't to do research, it's just to embarrass them all. And then, you know, she comes into the room, she's the speaker, they all give her the coat staying up and then she gets on stage to speak to them. They crawled under their chairs. Um, but the, that, whether that changes them or just gives them a moment of pain is the question for us. Um, but I have a hunch she'd be really interested in what you're working on. Oh, no, please do. Yep. Love to um, meet her. I know you would just love her. She's great. But one of the things that the people outside thinking about this, can you give us a few of the things about what they'll be asked for just to, so we give it a little sure. more flesh? I'd like to get them involved. Well, I've already mentioned there, we're going to ask for their assessment of the different levels of leadership, male leadership, and where they are on this continuum of allyship. We're going to be asking about those what their experience is in seeing these microaggressions, these everyday little things, the note taking, the being interrupted. We're going to ask about some specific things that really are allyship in action. Yes. You know, have the have you seen these things happening? Yeah. And how often? And again, we're going to be comparing the results, you know, uh, in terms of the male perspective versus the female perspective. We're also going to be really trying to assess too, what resources does it, do they see their organization providing? Is there a male ally community and how impactful is it? You know, that's one of the things we're really supporting in our work. We have a, a male ally advisory group, IWL hosts this every month, but it's a support group for men from different organizations that are leading these initiatives in their own companies. So, you know, understanding what's happening in, in your, you know, from their perception, of, you know, are these, are, is there an effort towards allyship in the organization? And, and of course, we'll be collecting demographic information solely for the purpose of being able to break down women into women of color, uh, women of different ages, women in different levels of the organization. So it's all confidential, anonymous, um, and, but we really appreciate people's participation because this is an important first step. And I is a WBC advocate member and in love with it. And what you're doing uh, is transformational. And I'm urging the folks Thank who you. watch this, we're pushing this out very quickly because we want to be able to celebrate the results and be able to come together at a conference, but then begin to share it inside your own organizations and know how to do something. 
Because I think the mystery here is, I know I need to, but how do I? Which is really going to be important, right? Absolutely. And I'll just say that, you know, this, this data, <laughs> data itself is a call to action. And one of the things I'm particularly excited about, you know, we're involved in the, the WBC's initiative on allyship. And we're also further putting the gas on our allyship programming. And we have our annual conference coming up on June 8th and 9th. But we're adding for the first time, excuse me, just lost the AirPod here. We are adding for the first time to our programming an allyship summit. And we're going to be further expanding programming to women being allies for women, um, certainly addressing more intersectional needs of allyship, you know, women of color, LGBTQ. Um, we're going to be doing programming around allyship for introverts in this virtual world. Yes. introverts can feel very much on the outsides and other invisible characteristics of people. So oh, uh, stay tuned, buckle in much more in that. <laughs> but we do have to, we do have to get the gender, the gender allyship right first, because it is the gateway to the other areas that are so important as well. Yep. Kim, any last thoughts? And I'll wrap us up. I would say, well, certainly please participate in this survey again, and we're open at least through April 10th and may extend it another week based on some companies asking us to do that. But I think you just individually recognize that we each have some level of privilege over someone else. And who can we help lift up? Yeah. Who can we advocate for? And this is something that it's not just about our workplaces, it's in every part of our life. And it, it is something that we all have an opportunity to be intentional about and work on every day. So I love it. It's gratifying mm -hmm. work. We, we all have work and we'll be better together if we do it together. Well, I, you know, the WBC believes that we can go faster, further together. But I'm always laughing because what Edie Fraser did forming the WBC was say, stop yeah. thinking, collaborate. Let's right. help each other, be allies to each other. And the idea of bringing 30% of the folks in here for men is that there are a lot of men who see this as their opportunity as well, because then we can transform a whole lot of other things that matter. So this is really um, extraordinarily important. I urge all of our listeners and viewers to please sign up, take the survey and help us help you do better because that's our job, right? Um, I'll have Kim's information available on the podcast blog, and when we push it out, we will certainly do that to everybody. But I'm Andy Simon. It's been a pleasure having you on our podcast today. Kim Grant Lee has been marvelous. And for all of you who come, you know, you've pushed us to the top 5% of global podcasts. Exactly what that means, I'm not sure. But I do know that a lot of you send us emails all over the place about who you want to hear and how it will affect you. My job is to help you get off the brink. And sometimes you have to see through a fresh lens, feel, remember we decide with the heart and then the brain comes in. So this is some time for us to really start to transform our society and join in. It's been fun. Hey, thank you all. Thanks for coming. Goodbye now, Kim. Thanks so much. It's been fun. Fun to share. Thank you, Edie. Bye.